All right, look, um, <clears throat> welcome to the, uh, the lunchtime webinar. Um, this is another one in our uh, series of data literacy presentations. And what we're going to look at today is really how to select data management tools. Um, <clears throat> they're very, very useful things, and there's some good ways to do it and some not so good ways to do it. And, and that's the topic. What we'll also do after my sort of uh, presentation about the theory and practice, we'll actually uh, I'll hand over to Joe, and Joe is going to talk about uh, precisely his offerings in this space, particularly around uh, data quality, metadata management, and, and data governance. So um, I've been in, in the industry now for a long time. Um, I'm a passionate uh, advocate of uh, good data management practice and a bit of an enthusiast when it comes to data literacy. Um, some of you might have seen me in some of these uh, earlier broadcasts. Uh, if you have, welcome back. If you haven't, uh, it's nice to see you coming into Dharma. I won't go much into the background about Catapult. We're a professional services. Uh, organization specializing in data management services and we partner with a number of leading uh, software vendors uh, who have some very good products in this space. So what are we going to focus on today? Um, first of all um, we'll have a quick look at uh, what is good data management and, and, and what does it look like when you see it. Um, for those of you that are uh, familiar with this topic, um, sorry, but it's a little bit of a refresher. For those of you who haven't, I think it's important to understand some basic principles about what good looks like. Uh, I'll talk about the role of metadata management. I believe it's one of the most uh, fundamental uh, practices in data management and it's something that you have to get right. Also uh, introduce the concept of business facing data services and how technology can enable those services and it's the services that people consume in business. As a case study of the right and wrong ways to go about selecting the right tools for your organization, as a case study we'll look at metadata software tools but the, the overall process and the principles involved here can be generalized to other things. It could be governance, it could be data quality, it could be data modeling. As I said, there's some right ways and some wrong ways and, uh, and we'll generalize this uh, to, to other tools. So to start off, let's remind ourselves what is good data management and what does it look like? Well, fortunately, there is, a, there is an easy solution to this. I can point you to the Dharma DMBOK body of knowledge. Um, very, very good source of information. It codifies best practice in data management skills and knowledge. It's applicable to all industry sectors. Uh, it's widely distributed. It's used all over the world. It's very, very accessible. And, you know, here in Australia, we have a very active Dharma chapter. And for those of you that uh, haven't been to Dharma uh, events before, please come along and, and consider joining. It's a, a very, very good way to meet other people in the industry and, and learn about best practice. Why, why care about data management? What, why, why put all the effort into it? Well, basically, if we manage data better, we can use that data to improve our business outcomes. All right, data management isn't an end in itself. It's a means to an end. The end that we're looking here is improvement in business outcomes. And I firmly believe, as do many of my colleagues, that if we can manage data well, that good data management can contribute to better business outcomes. Also, we believe that it's, it's a good idea to have a consistent, integrated, enterprise-wide approach. Some of you probably work in very large organizations, large government agencies, large financials. You may have experienced where data management can be often quite fragmented, isolated, little islands of practice. We believe that the best way to do good data management and to get improved business outcomes is to take a whole of enterprise approach, a coordinated approach. Dharma DMBOK is a very good starting point. It provides us with a common vocabulary for us to talk together as professionals and as professionals to talk to the business. And it provides some very, very good guidelines in terms of how to do good data management practice. What we can do with DMBOK is we can then take this uh, general advice and we can create organizational specific 
uh, what we call frameworks and those frameworks will describe the specific policies processes roles competencies and software tools that we're going to use in our specific organization to implement good data management and have better business outcomes now uh, it's important to remember here that facet uh, software is only one facet of capability uh, when we're building and improving data management capability we have to keep our eye on all the other facets do we have policy do we have definitions of what good looks like people do we have the right people do we have enough of them do they have the right skills do they understand their roles have they been trained knowledge there's both general knowledge about data management but also specific knowledge about our business how it works and the business ecosystem that it lives in process how do we do things how are we going to do data management what are the specific duties tasks activities that we perform these needs to be defined executed communicated and measured and finally we need some automation or software tools people don't have to do all the work some of it can be done by software so data management building capability is all about these different facets software is clearly one important facet i also believe that within the practices of data management some of those practice areas are a little bit more fundamental than others certainly data governance metadata data quality the management of reference and master data these are some practice areas that really need to be nailed and, and have to be executed very well in the organization these are not the only ones that you have to focus on but if you don't make good progress on these particular areas pretty much everything else you'll do will struggle and, uh, and not bear fruit the analogy i use here is i call these the spine capabilities or the spine practice areas and the analogy i use here is uh, with uh, rugby league if you follow rugby league you might be f familiar with the concept of the spine of the footy team so there's certain positions in the footy team that if the players in those positions are performing at the highest level then the team as a whole tends to perform quite well if your spine players are off the game then the team won't perform and it'll probably lose having said that you can't play rugby league with just four players <laughs> you need all 13 on the side at the same time working together and that's the analogy that i use so those certain uh practices in data management are a bit more fundamental if you like they're the spine practices that that are that hold the thing together and when we're doing an uplift you know yes it's good let's let's try and jump into some of these practices but steady on you know before we can do good data security good data architecture let's make sure our data governance and metadata is well understood and we're improving that and uplifting that and then once we've done that we can then start to focus on data quality the management of reference and master data so there are certain dependencies between the practice areas as i said you can't just do these four you have to do all of them but some of them are a little bit more important than others now i believe that one of the most important practice areas that you need to understand uh, define improve refine communicate and really uplist first first of all is metadata management now why is that well the reason for that is that everything that you do in data management whether it's data quality data architecture bi data warehousing security data governance everything that you do uses it consumes and produces metadata metadata in my opinion it's the glue that binds all this stuff together okay once you understand that concept and once you know how to manage all that different kinds of metadata that binds stuff together you will be taking a great leap forward in terms of your ability to uplift everything you do in in data management it is the most fundamental or one of the most fundamentals okay as I said, there's lots of different kinds of metadata, but understanding the different kinds and how it's associated with each other, how it works together is critical, in my opinion, to doing good data management. So we're going to look at the, uh, the specific area of 
uh, metadata management tools today. And there is lots of uh, material out there that can provide good guidance and opinion. So uh, Gartner and Forrester, they, they do regular publications in this area. Some of you might have seen the Gartner uh, Magic Quadrants. They do one every year on metadata management and they uh, identify which uh, vendors they believe are sort of in the leading, the challenging, and the visionaries, and so on. Very useful. I mean, you know, it's just one source of information, but it is quite a useful source of information. Interestingly, what Gartner and Forrest are reporting is that pretty much all the vendors in this space in the last four or five years have really invested a lot of R&D effort in this space. So I've been working in the industry for some decades and you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, this area was not as hot as it is now. And you know, some of the tools were you know, lacking uh, somewhat, but in the last four or five years, we've seen significant investment in all the major product vendors and these tools are, are growing in importance. Now, uh, in terms of selecting metadata management tools, let's just take a little bit of a step back. So where, where is metadata in our organization and, and how do we find it? How do we use software to manage it? So metadata lives just about everywhere in the workplace where we've got some kind of data. So whether it's a, a, a DBMS like SQL Server or Oracle, whether it's your document management system, spreadsheets, SharePoint, all the different places where data can exist in your organization, nearly always there will be for each of those data sources, a collection of metadata in that system, which describes broadly what, what that system contains. Okay, so it, it, it's all over the place. And the value that uh, metadata management tools provides, they're often called data cataloging tools, is that these tools can basically go out, connect to all these different systems and find and suck in and consolidate into a metadata repository, all the metadata that lives in your organization at the moment. So these are very, very powerful pieces of software. Now, depending on the size of your organization, how many different information systems you've got, how many scanners you connect to these things, these uh, metadata, management tools, these data cataloging tools, they can suck in vast quantities of raw metadata. There can be hundreds of thousands, even millions of data objects have been found and are cataloged in, in, in the repository of these tools. So very, very powerful things. You know, once you get to a sort of medium to large size organization, this kind of automation, this kind of uh, smart software is really necessary if you're gonna manage uh, your metadata. Very, very tiny organizations, you might get away without one, but these days, most medium to large scale organizations, if you're gonna do enterprise-wide metadata management, you really ought to be looking at these kinds of tools. Now, as I said before, metadata touches all the different practice areas that we have in data management. And there's lots and lots of different kinds of metadata. And all of that different kinds of metadata can live in your enterprise catalog. So there's the raw technical metadata, there's things like business glossaries, reference data, data domains, output from data quality profiling tools, data governance metadata, data security metadata. There is lots and lots and lots of different kinds. Now, that's a lot of metadata <laughs> to understand and manage and get on top of. So getting your tooling right is important, but also, Tooling is only one facet of capability. You need to have your processes, your policy, and your people in place as well. So some of the challenges that many organizations encounter when they're trying to uh, get the right tooling for their organization is that, look, most of the software product vendors focus on tools, not capabilities. Remember, you know, it's not just the software, but being a software vendor, what do they talk about most? Well, software, of course, but you've got to remember, don't get carried away with everything the vendor tells you about their software. Software is just one facet of capability. Another sort of differentiator between the different products is many vendor products have derived from a specific function in data management. As I mentioned earlier, 
data management's tended to evolve over the last few decades as quite discrete, specific practice areas. So the data modelers just do the data modeling. The quality people just do data quality. Um, you know, the BI people, they just do the BI stuff, okay? And many of the existing data management tools, particularly metadata management tools, have grown out of a specific function or a specific data practice areas. So many of them have grown out of the data dictionary of a DBMS. Some of them have grown out of a DQ tool. Others have grown out of ETL tools. Some of them have grown out of modeling tools. Some of them were created for very, very specific niche areas, which was the management of data definitions, such as Meteor and Aristotle. So, you know, it's these days, uh, there's, there's a lot of common functionality, but it's worth bearing in mind that many of the tools that you'll find in this space have origins in a specific niche area of data management. Now, also, most importantly, there is no one tool that provides all the functionality that you require for enterprise uh, data management and certainly not for enterprise metadata management, all right? Each tool has got pretty good coverage across many different areas and coverage across many different types of metadata, but there is no one tool that can do everything for you, okay? And so every tool that you can buy, this isn't a, a, an exhaustive list, there's, there's many others. Each one of these tools has their own strengths and weaknesses and coverage over the different kinds of metadata. Essentially, there is no one tool to rule them all. And when you're doing data management at an enterprise-wide level, typically you're going to have to blend a number of different tools together. Uh, and certainly in the metadata management space, you probably need more than one, okay? So understanding the strengths and weaknesses of these tools is, is very important, okay? And uh, also, we need to understand that many of these tools are not going to be seen directly by the end consumers of, of data services. I want to introduce this concept of what I call business-facing data services. A very good example of this is Google. So most of us these days use Google search engine to go and find stuff, okay? Google is a data service. It's a, a business facing data service. It's something that we as, as, as business people or, or just as members of the public, we use this uh, as a data service. Interestingly, Google is a very, very good example of a data service enabled by metadata technology. Google doesn't store a copy of the internet, but a copy of the internet's metadata. And it's got very, very sophisticated uh, search and indexing uh, software in it so that it can actually run uh, very, very fast searches over vast amounts of metadata very quickly. It's probably the best example of a metadata enabled or a metadata driven data service, okay? And, and I think this is important for a number of reasons. Data service is very, very important. Most people are not gonna see the raw uh, metadata that the tools are manipulating and finding. They're actually gonna see a service that's provided to them, but it's enabled by metadata. And that's how in data management, how metadata is generally used. Now, there may be a few uh, specialist individuals who are real gurus in metadata technology that will regularly manipulate and use those metadata management tools, but most people are not gonna see metadata directly through those tools. They're gonna see it through a Google-like data service. So that data service might be browse the information landscape, find me a glossary of business terms that we use in our organization, locate all the standard data definitions. What does this piece of data mean? So there are services that people consume, data services, and they're gonna be enabled by metadata, but those services will be enabled by different kinds of metadata. So our uh, browse the information landscape, may be enabled by the, the raw technical, the enriched technical metadata. Locate standard data definitions, that's mapping onto another different kind of metadata. They're all driven by metadata, but each one of those data services maps onto different subsets of the overall catalog and the different kinds of metadata. 
The coverage of the tools, as, as I mentioned earlier, there is no one tool to rule them all. So each tool will be really accomplished in some areas of metadata, but there isn't a tool that does all kinds of metadata wonderfully. All right, so there is, now some of these tools have pretty good broad coverage, but there, as I said, there is no one tool that does everything. And when you're looking for metadata tools, you're gonna to have to bear this in mind. It could be that you need two or three. There is no one tool to rule them all. So data services are driven by metadata, different kinds. Tools have strengths and weaknesses over certain areas. So where does this put us in terms of finding the right tools for our organization um, to help us improve our data management practice and get the better outcomes. Well, the place that you start with tool acquisition is knowing your business. You have to start with the business processes that consume and produce data. And this is true of any data management tool, okay? Whether it's metadata, data quality, any tool that you're gonna buy, you always start with the business and the business processes that produce and, and who in those business processes are gonna consume data services that are gonna help them make better decisions. And broadly, this is the process I believe you should follow. So understanding the business, what are the pain points, where are the decisions being made? Being able to analyze the business, understand opportunities for improvement, translate those into solution options, and those solution options will have one or more distinct data services that people in those business processes can consume. By consuming that, whether it's uh, browsing the landscape, finding glossaries of terms. People in the business processes can consume those data services. By consuming the data services, they make better decisions. So as I mentioned earlier, what kinds of metadata do those data services map onto, all right? Once we know what the data services are and we've mapped them on the different kinds of metadata, then we can start to look at, well, hang on, we need these kinds of metadata over here and these vendors map pretty well onto that. Maybe we should be looking at the tools from these vendors to support the desired data services. Once you've done that, you can then go out, run your procurement process. There's probably, you know, two or three or four or more options. You select the ones that you need and then you can deploy the tools, you can build and configure and publish the data services. People in the business can then consume them. By consuming the data services, they make better decisions and you get better process outcomes. That's broadly what it looks like. So understand the business, identify, understand data services that people consume, map that onto tool functionality, and that should then drive which tools you're gonna to consider for acquisition. Now, ideally, that's the process we should follow. In practice, we see uh, a number of not so good ways, okay? This, I think, is the better way to do it, but there's some not so good ways, and I'll just highlight some of these in case you've seen them as well. So, sometimes we've seen uh, clients undertake what we call the reverse journey. <laughs> So someone in the organization has a bucket of money. For whatever reason, they've gone out and bought a whole bunch of tools. Hmm, what are these tools good for? Where can we use them? There's something to do with data management. I know, we'll go out into the, into the organization, find someone, maybe in a business area somewhere, who thinks they're responsible for data management. We'll hand them over to them, and they can then go and do something useful with them, okay? Um, the reverse journey, <laughs> you've got it back to front, okay? Uh, very common, <laughs> uh, uh, which is a worry, okay? But um, hopefully as, as data literacy permeates uh, through, through uh, the different economic sectors and people understand this better, we'll see less of that. Um, another not so good way is what I call the vendor or the CIO group driven approach. So. CIO group invites in a whole bunch of vendors. They do a lot of presentations. The CIO or one of their delegates goes, "Ma, oh, yes, these, these tools, are, they, they look pretty useful actually. I reckon the business will really find them very, very helpful. So they go out, they go and buy the tools, they then hand them over to some business area and the business area goes, well, what are we supposed to do with these? Uh, 
well, they're good for you. <laughs> uh, do good things with them. Make the business work better. Okay. So, um, yes, we've seen this happen before. It's not, not so good. Uh, and sometimes the let's take the shortcut. Um, so your CTO or other uh, senior person has, has been to the Gartner conference. They've drunk all the Kool-Aid. They know what they want and uh, they go, yep, I've got it. That's it. Gartner says we need one of these. I'll go out and buy one. They go out and buy one. They hand them over to the business and say, here you go. Uh, off you go. Do something useful with these. Okay. So those are three variants. There are other variants. I'm not saying those are the only three, but basically, you know, at the end of the day, this needs to be business focused, business problem, translating to data services, data services, what enabling technology do we need? What are the candidate vendors that have that technology? That's the process that should be followed. Okay. So as I said, we've, we've mostly focused there on metadata management tools. This approach though is, is generalizable to any data management tool you want to uh, acquire, whether it's data governance, data quality, data modeling, data architecture, whatever you're doing, it's broadly the same, okay? Understand business need and the pain points. Identify data services. Sometimes those correspond to specific use cases to satisfy those needs. Map the data services into tool functionality and its associated metadata. Select ones which are candidates understand the coverage and functionality and the integration capability because there is no one tool to rule them all, okay? Evaluate your candidates, choose the most appropriate. Then you can deploy the tools, you can configure capabilities, you can create your, bit, your data service and you can publish the data service to the consumers. And hopefully, if your analysis has been good, then that data service will help people do their process better, okay? Don't rely on a single point of organizational expertise or authority. Don't take shortcuts. Now, the other thing is, remember, it's not just the tools, it's capability. So we need to think along the lines of tools are good, but what's, have we got the policy? Have we got the right people? Have we got the knowledge process in place? As an example, let's have a look at data quality capabilities, all right? So going out and buying a data quality tool isn't going to fix anything on its own, okay? You have to go through that process and you have to have all those facets. You need policies, legislation, standards that define what good quality is, all right? You need human beings to actually create what we call data definitions. These are formal definitions of what good data looks like. What is a correct Medicare number? What's a correct tax file number? What's the correct coding for indigenous status, etc. There's lots and lots of data definitions. You need those definitions of good data. Only human beings create those. Once you've got the good definitions, you can store them in a metadata registry. And then your software tool, your data quality tool, if you're going to profile some source data and understand the quality, it can read those definitions of what good data looks like. It can compare the source data with the good definitions and it can tell you whether they match or not, okay? If they don't match, then they're probably not very good. This can then produce a data quality reporting service, which can then be consumed by a data service consumer, okay? So, all those different facets, we need the process, we need the policy, we need human judgment, as well as the software, okay? Software is important, but it's only one part of it. Now, hopefully that's uh, entertained you and given you some food for thought. Uh, what I'm going to do next is I'm gonna hand over to, to Joe. Joe is, Dantas is from Precisely, and he's gonna talk about Precisely's tool offerings in this area with a particular focus on data quality, metadata management and data governance. Okay, so Joe, are you okay to take control of the screen? Yes, absolutely. Let's see if it's working. That should have come through now, that's John. coming through. Yeah, that's all good. Right, I'll, uh, I'll keep quiet and, and hand over to you for a while. Excellent. Thank you, John, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Really appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us. Uh, firstly, you know, Precisely is the new company formed through SyncSort's acquisition of the Pitney Bowes software and data business. And earlier this year, we also acquired Infogix, expanding our capability and data integrity offerings. 
We have a rich heritage spanning over 40 years working with mainframe and legacy data and now extending our breadth in portfolio to drive our data integrity suite to enable customers to extract value from their information wherever and whenever they need it. We have staff in uh, Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane, supported by a large network of partners supporting our customers across government and commercial businesses and strong integration with leading technology um, companies such as Databricks, Snowflake, AWS and, and so forth. Precisely brings together the best of these businesses to create an end-to-end -end mature product portfolio with a singular focus on data integrity. Precise is a leader in data integrity and to us, Data integrity is data that is accurate, consistent, and most importantly, rich in context for business decision making. We know that your data integrity journey is unique to you and Precisely is here to support you, not only today, but to help you continue to deliver trusted data that builds possibilities for your organization into the future. Our data integrity suite empowers better, faster, and more confident business decision making, allows businesses to trust their data is accurate, consistent, and contextualized, delivers value in all five pillars of data integrity, data integration, data governance, data quality, location intelligence, and data enrichment in a single modular suite. And this provides the flexibility to choose the specific capabilities of the suite to address your organization's unique business challenges without a large platform investment. Our aim is to preserve your investment existing infrastructure by working seamlessly and alongside your technology investments. Following on from John's presentation, I think it's important that you consider technology that can provide a modular framework to meet your needs today and into the future. We believe this is important because we go on the journey with you and focus on the business requirements and implement the appropriate modules to support your data integrity journey. Let's expand on these five elements of data integrity. As John pointed out, to support your tool selection, there are five capabilities, there are key capabilities that you need to consider to support those business drivers. The Precisely platform provides end-to-end -end capability. You can see here, starting with our first pillar, data integration, accessing legacy systems, then harvesting your metadata, setting up your business glossary, standardizing and cleansing your data, um, maybe adding additional spatial attributes so that you can view patterns based on locations and enriching your data with, for example, demographics data for more contextualized reports and dashboards. We're here and we can support you from the list of functionality. So why is data integrity important? The latest Office of the Information Commissioner report shows that Australian government agencies reported 34 data breaches over the last six months. 25 were the result of human error, including eight cases where private information was sent to the wrong person. The top chart represents the kinds of personal information involved in breaches. Most data breaches, in fact 91%, involved contact information such as an individual's name, home address, phone number or email address. And this is distinct from identity information, which was exposed 50% of the time um, of the data breaches with individuals' date of birth, passport details and driver's license details. Financial details such as bank accounts and credit cards were involved in about 40 odd percent of those breaches. You've seen that bottom chart, it highlights human error being the main cause of government data breaches. Common examples of human error breaches include sending personal information to the wrong recipient via email. It accounted for about 40%. Unintended release or publication of personal information, about 23% and failure to use the BCC function when sending out group emails made up about 8%. Unauthorized disclosure affected on average over 525,000 individuals uh, by these breaches. And you know, I think, and you'll agree with what John said, organizations can really reduce the risk of human error by educating staff about secure information and handling practices and putting data governance into place to prevent these. When we get it wrong, <laughs> we're reminded, and it ends up in the media. Um, Tasmania Ambulance, uh, for example, pager information was made public, which included you know, patients' health details had like HIV status, gender, age, which raised concerns that it could lead to discrimination and stigmatization. Um, Northern Territory residents had personal information and business email addresses released in a, in a data breach email sent by the health department in relation to the government's COVID check-in application. This exposed over 4,400 private business and government contacts with all personal and business addresses open for everyone to see and use. 
In April just of last year, Optus was hit with a class action complaint after it mistakenly published the names, addresses and phone numbers of tens of thousands of customers in their white pages run by census. Um, an employee at Yarra Trams released personal email addresses to nearly 100 people in the email from Yarra Trams officer to commuters rejecting their compensation requests. The private email addresses of each of the commuters was exposed. <clears throat> Service New South Wales, a data breach impacted over 100,000 people that had some level of data in compromised mailboxes. Now, while they were able to successfully send out letters to over 63,000 of them, around 54,000 were still not notified and 36,000 of those were never contacted because they weren't able to source a current residential mailing address. And in that bottom example there, tens of thousands of scanned New South Wales driver's licenses and completed tolling notice statutory declarations were left exposed on an open Amazon Web Service storage instance. Transport for New South Wales didn't know how that sensitive data ended up in the cloud, um, but one folder contained over 100,000 images of the front and back of scanned driver's licenses. So how do you get around the challenges of implementing data governance successfully? At Precisely, we focus on a business first approach. And as it's simple as it sounds, we see higher success and quicker benefits realized by following this methodology. It starts with linking data governance to business goals, as John pointed out several times, prioritizing the data that matters, building stakeholder engagement across all three levels of the organization, and I can't state how important that is, and clearing the path for, for, for success. Let me expand on this. In the first step, link data governance to business goals. Identify the business goals you are looking to improve and which business in initiatives impact that goal. Every organization is working towards these goals, whether it's to minimize risk, to deliver better insights, um, data-driven decision-making or operational effectiveness. What are the key initiatives in each goal you're looking to achieve? Then think about how data is used to drive all three initiatives. This is no longer a project-based piece of work, but one that impacts the entire organization. The same data can impact all three initiatives, such as good quality customer data. And then think about how this will be used to drive and inform your strategy moving forward. Secondly, prioritize the data that matters. Data exists in so many systems, in tables and files. The majority of your data does not need to be governed, only the data you need to drive actionable insights and business value needs to be governed. We have found that focusing appropriately, um, a, yeah, focusing appropriately can deliver about five times faster results for the organization. And typically only 5% of your critical data drives 95% of the business results. Thirdly, build engagement across the organization and increase adoption with your functional teams. Once we've identified what initiatives are important to our objectives, the data that matters. Now we need to make sure it resonates with our internal stakeholders. Data programs are built from three levels, usually top down like a, a governance program due to compliance event, and it's imperative that everyone is on board. John referred to these individuals as the spine of the team, and it takes these individuals to really drive these campaigns. Finally, have a clear path for success. Set up processes to help achieve desired outcomes, to find success. Make it easy for business teams to contribute keep teams engaging, engaged and wanting more to add value. For example, in terms of healthcare, data governance solution should allow you to harvest a data catalog and define a business glossary. This is critical when you're getting data from lots of different sources where there's confusion around terminology. A data catalog not only allows you to find the data you need, but it also democratizes the knowledge of how that data should be used now because it's documented in that catalog rather than sitting in someone's head. You know what happens when people leave the organization and all that knowledge walks out with them. If you deal with lots of sensitive data, confidential personal and health information, you need to be sure about who can access a particular data set and what are the policies that govern how it can be used. Often these policies are sitting in SharePoint or team sites which are removed from the actual data source. Data governance brings this together and makes it easy to see which policies relate to which data sets. I re referenced some of these of the examples of what can happen if you get this wrong and, and John talked to this point clearly as well. Data lineage and impact and analysis is essential to be able to see where your data is coming from, whether it, it's externally or from third party providers or from an internal system. You can see how it flows through your organization. What are the business processes that can touch it? 
and then how any changes might impact those processes and downstream systems. Third party providers are notorious for making changes, um, you know, and then a report breaks that you're using that data for. But with lineage and impact analysis, you can trace this back and see what source data has the impact and then get it transformed again. Governance and data quality scores help you understand if a particular data asset should be trusted. For example, does the asset meet specific conditions, such as whether it's been certified, whether there's an owner or steward assigned, whether it has been classified and has a description. It helps to put the asset into context. For example, you may have 10 different email fields, but which one do you trust? And of course, reporting and analytics there at the end. All of the above points are crucial to reporting and analytics. A data governance solution helps you find the data you need, understand how it should be used, and to what extent it can be trusted, which ultimately feeds into the quality of reports and analytics. Now, bringing this back to what John spoke about, choosing a tool, do the research. There is a fair amount available out there. Review analyst reports such as Gartner and Forrester. In this example from Gartner, when surveying our customers, they cited our customers saying they prefer Data 360 for its ease of use and flexibility. Some of the key points John touched on, what is the business process we want to improve? Speak in terms of the business, understands and knows. The tool needs to be intuitive so that the business can adopt and use from the glossary down to, the, down to business lineage. Um, is it designed with business users in mind and can be leveraged by non-technical people to realize value? Can they also associate that assets with business goals, objectives and metrics to measure the completion of data governance activities? Embedded data quality and data analysis. Is data quality part of that data governance? Yes, you can bring in results from other tools, but can you also leverage some of the data quality tool advanced capabilities, such as calculating governance scores? Configuration and flexible metadata models. Can you easily allow users to configure whatever business and technical assets they want to include in associated attributes? This should all be done in a user-friendly interface that allows non-technical users to design and build the structure that meets the needs of the organization. Does the solution have the ability to harvest metadata, as John pointed out? Most government tools have, this, have to use third-party products to harvest metadata. Our platform can harvest the metadata as native part of the platform and even go further by applying machine learning to assist with data categorization. Precisely, um, as I mentioned, Acquired Infogix has been named a leader in the most recent Forrester Wave uh, Data Governance Solutions Review. You saw in John's report from 2020, they were a, uh, a key player. Um, and recently with Precise's acquisitions and really extending its capability around data integrity, we've now moved into, into the leader's quadrant. Precisely was specifically cited for its well-rounded data governance solution with solid data quality capabilities and data strategy consulting services scored among the top three in both strategy and current, current offering categories and differentiated by providing a data foundation for business decision-making at scale and driving data literacy, balancing strong technical capabilities with extensive management capabilities and ensuring security, privacy and compliance to drive accountability and trust. Thank you all. Um, I'm gonna hand back to Andrew to see if there's any questions from the audience. We have a, a couple of questions. One of them is in the, in the chat box. The, um, if you basically none of the data management there is in place, including organizational structure and, po and policies, would you still start with metadata management first? Is that, that sort of part of the EDM journey, I think? So, uh, John, your answer there? Well, look, um, I think you, you start with the fundamentals. So you, you try and start at the same time with your governance and your metadata, your data quality. I think you, you, you really need to uh, have, have your data governance in place, first of all. But even before your data governance is fully implemented, um, you, you quickly need to, to, to move on to understanding metadata but it's not just a question of tackling these as individual subject areas. You, you need to have that holistic understanding of how all the different data management practices are connected to each other and how they support it. So, you know, if you're doing, if you're going to do good data quality, you need to have prescriptive metadata around the definitions, data domain definitions. What does good data look like? Okay. So that is is governance 
it's metadata, but you also need that if you're going to do data quality, if you're going to do things like profiling. So these practice areas are, uh, or should be, treated holistically, and, and you need to understand the connections between them and how they fit together. So um, yes, you, you, you do start with, with quite a bit of emphasis on the fundamentals, but you, you, you need to take a holistic approach at the same time. I think what you're trying to avoid here is uh, diving into, oh, let's go and acquire a data integration platform that's full of AI magical technology that can suck in all of our data, fix everything and do all the analysis, et cetera, et cetera, okay? We, we come across clients who've just leapt forward <laughs> to several, tried to leap forward several levels of maturity into a, 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 a world of advanced prescriptive and predictive analytics. But hang on, you, you haven't got the basics in place. You've, you've got no data quality framework. You've got no metadata management. You've, you've got no governance. You can't leap forward without having those. You've got to learn to crawl then you walk and then you run <laughs> okay and then you get a bicycle and then you know you know you, you you've got there's a sequence okay and and that maturation you know you can't just leap forward uh it and and you know sign up for the olympics when you can barely crawl okay it's it's and and that's why those fundamental practices need to be given a lot of thought and effort at the beginning but as I said, it's not as individual distinct practices, but as part of a holistic approach. So quickly, one more question. What about the other areas of data management, the, you know, the DMBOC wheel, like BI, data operations and things like that? When do you focus on those? Well, you, you, you can start focusing on, on them right at the beginning. If you're taking a holistic approach, you're focusing on everything. But more effort initially when you're a low maturity organization if you're coming to this and you don't really have much formality or rigor or very very little capability in place where your initial effort needs to go is predominantly into the the fundamental areas but also getting a holistic approach most organizations we deal with have got a legacy they've been doing data management of some kind for some decades there's there's a there's a mainframe in the basement there's there's mid-range stuff over here they did a merger and acquisition they've got databases they've got millions and millions of spreadsheets all over most people have got a legacy of trying to manage data over a number of decades so very rarely do we see a completely greenfield site and usually associated with that legacy of uh, historical data management is distinct islands or silos of practice. Oh yes, that division over there. Yeah, they they know how to do document management. Nobody else does. <laughs> oh well, they they started it once, but they gave up. And and that mob over there. Yeah, we reckon they've got some data modeling skills, but they never talk to anybody else. And so you get these sort of silos or islands, disconnected islands of data management practice. So it's, it's not just the wheel and the fundamentals, it's also about taking an enterprise-wide approach and holistically looking at how do we move these practices forward. At the end of the day, we're not doing data management just for the sake of it. We're doing data management because it's gonna hopefully contribute to better business outcomes. So the better we manage our data, the better we exploit our data, the better business outcomes we're going to get. And in my opinion, the best way to get the better business outcomes is to take an enterprise-wide holistic approach and try and coordinate data management <laughs> across all the different parts of the organization and to have those enterprise frameworks. You need to have enterprise definitions of what the policy is, what good practice is, what bad practice should be avoided, okay? so. Yeah, and it's, it's like, you know, the analogy with the football team, you know, you know, you can't, Melbourne Storm can't field four players and hope to win the grand final when they're up against 13 in the opposition. You, you've got to have all 13 players on the field, okay? And it's the same with data management. Um, maybe, maybe two or three of them get sent off for 10 minutes. <laughs> but, but, you know, you, it, it's just that certain positions, certain practice areas are a bit more critical than others. That's, that's what I'm trying to say with the fundamentals. 
Okay, so got three questions. We're already over time, so you have to answer them very quickly. So the first mm -hmm. one is uh, a question for Joe. Government client here has precisely been evaluated against Commonwealth government security classifications. Yes, no. <laughs> Uh, to, to different degrees. Um, we've worked with different government organisations that have looked at it. Um, yeah, so we really need to sit down with that particular individual and, and understand what they're trying to achieve. Okay. Um, so uh, according to DMBOT, data governance is exercise of authority and control over the management of data assets. This is already complex enough. Why do we need to introduce even more confluted terms such as data governance management? Is this term about management of what itself is supposed to be optimised for data management practice is? Yeah, so I didn't understand that question. I think that you're, you're talking about data governance management. Is that is, is there something separate or is that, you know, is it, are you adding more complexity by adding that term? Uh, no, so um, no, it's just data management is just one of the practices, it, sorry, data governance is one of the practices of data management. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's governance and data and governance management. I'm not, not sure what the question was really. Um, okay, well, uh, we'll any, off, maybe um, David can uh, clarify it, email it. I mean, the, there is, there is a, 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 a difference between defining uh, data governance and executing it. So, um, you know, if, you, if you're going to have, if you're going to do data governance, i.e. you're going to execute the practice of data governance, you have to define exactly what it looks like in your organization. And so having uh, an enterprise-wide approved uh, document, typically a framework document, which says data governance framework, this is how our organization will execute data governance. You need to have one of those and then hopefully what, what you do, your execution actually follows the framework. You do what you're supposed to do. Uh, and then of course, with, with any business processes and any management practice, you, you need to measure things as well because you can't manage what you can't measure. So when you're executing data governance, you should be collecting appropriate metrics about your execution. You know, how many data stewards have you got? How long did it take to approve this document, et cetera? There's always going to be metrics that you need to measure in terms of uh, while you're doing data governance. And you'll then look at those metrics and, and try and uh, optimize and improve your performance. Uh, so a couple more questions. Data management for enterprise needs to divide and conquer approach. I suppose to set priorities. What's the best way of doing this? By data mains or by business processes? Yeah, look, I, I think um, so. So as with data governance and, and the other practice areas, I think having a, a holistic approach to data management, so it's all the practice areas, as well as an enterprise, whole of enterprise view is very important when you write those frameworks, the, 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 we will prescribe, this is how we shall do data management in our organization. Obviously, when it comes to the actual execution, you can only execute if you've got enough people with the right skills to do it. And that's where typically things fall over. Right, writing enterprise frameworks is easy. Uh, finding enough people with the right skills and the right motivation to actually execute them is the tough bit. Uh, now, uh, most large organizations we work with are not greenfield. So they've already got a number of people in the organization executing. There's a couple of data modelers over there. There's an ETL guy there. We've got a heap of BI people that fiddle around with the warehouse. So that there's, there's typically already people executing bits of data management in often uncoordinated discrete areas. So maybe the approach to execution is to try and bring them together and marshal them or orchestrate them in some way, but you're probably going to have to hire more and train more because in my opinion, most organizations we work with, um, even if they do have some data management practice going on, they don't have enough people with the right skills. So um, yeah, frameworks, that's the easy bit. Uh, resourcing it uh, and, and those other facets of capability, particularly the human resources, that's the tough bit. Uh, and training them up, building up a stewards network. And one way of doing that is once you have your uh, roadmap, you may deploy 
that execution incrementally. So you might say, well, look, these processes are our most core critical processes. You know, we're a, we're a bank, we do loans. <laughs> okay, we take money in. <laughs> that's, that's where we're gonna focus. Uh, how to organize a Christmas party, no, we, won't, we won't worry about that business process, but the loans bit, let's get, we'll nail that. If, if you're a government agency that hands out social security benefits, well, the processes for evaluating claimants and handing out benefit, that's probably your core processes where you're gonna start, you know. Um, so in terms of actually the execution and the improvement, it's probably going to be incremental across areas of, of the business. And there may be some areas of the business that fine, they're important, but they're not as core as, as others. Uh, or the other approach is there may be some areas of the business that through mergers and acquisitions are a little bit easier to change than others okay so it's a combination of understanding yes we're going to do business improvement we're going to uplift data management capability here's our core processes but you know uh, there's the six core processes and four or five of them they're not easily changed but these two over here they're easy to change because they they came in when we did that acquisition and, and they're, they're right for you know so it, it's got to be pragmatic yeah, you, you're going to have to incrementally improve stuff as with any kind of business improvement. It's really hard to do a, you know, a big bang, just let's change everything and change everybody overnight. It's going to be incremental and you have to identify based on, you know, how core are those processes to your um, organization or how easily can they be changed? What's their appetite for, for, for change? Uh, that's another one uh, that's going to vary tremendously but in general you're not going to have enough resources so you're going to have to do it incrementally and build it out so very very quickly then so what uh, how do you know you've reached the optimal level of which each of each area in the wheel and can you move forward in purchasing software so i think what how do you know when you got to the point when you, you're ready to purchase software uh well look you can purchase software um uh, at an early stage, you don't, you don't have to be uh, a very high maturity to, to, to buy software, but you, you need to have a, a good process for, for acquiring it. Uh, and, you know, it's got to be done in the right way. So I think, you know, you've, you've as I said, you, you have to know your business. You know, think in terms of data services that different business areas will consume. I think this is why things like the concept of a data service is very important. It's very easy to get carried away with technology and we forget that, uh, you know, software is only one part of it. Uh, and in general, people want to, will consume a service and that service may, may have a significant automation, but it may have human experts. Uh, involved with it as well so uh, and and it may be a blend of different technologies so i think the concept of a, a, a data services and business processes consuming data service if you haven't got that sort of concept in your operating model then you're at a fairly low level of maturity and you need to have some concept of data services being consumed by business in order to to, to find the right tool Okay, and I think the problem is, it's not that organisations, um, you know, have left tool acquisition too early. It's often they've they've acquired tools without that deep understanding of what are the business facing data services that business needs to consume. That I think is 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 a core piece of analysis that needs to be done. Okay. Okay, that's it. That's all we have time for. <laughs> Okay. Somebody is asking for a lived like you know an experience or a case study, I suppose, of integrating tools to come with the various aspects of EDM practice. I wonder if um, if we can um, uh, get a, a you know a case study or something like that. We'll send it out in the slides. Just a case study of how that's happened. Um, yeah, look, um, I can I can add an appendix to to this slide deck, which is uh, uh, how how tools have been integrated together. Um, okay. I can right. do that as so it wasn't the main theme for today, but I yeah. can add an appendix for to the slide deck, and I'll send that to you, Andrew, and you can yeah. distribute it. 
so I, I will be sending out the copy of the slides and the recording either later today or tomorrow. Um, so thank you um, um, for John and for Joe for the presentation. Um, it's been very good, very interesting. Thanks a lot. Okay. Um, All right. So we hopefully we still have a Dharma meeting, Dharma Canberra meeting booked on the 20th of September. Um, we'll keep our fingers crossed <laughs> that we can be in the press club. Otherwise, it'll be another webinar. Yes, that's right. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Right. Thanks, Goodbye. everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.